Well, good morning. Thank you for joining with us at uh, East Memorial Baptist Church. Uh, Sunday, February the 28th. <clears throat> We're at the end of February already. And uh, you blink your eyes and it'll be springtime. Looking forward to it, though. Beautiful days the last few days. The Lord has blessed us with beautiful weather. And uh, just thank you for joining with us this morning. Look forward to seeing you in worship at uh, 1030 this morning. For my class, I have several prayer requests I wanted to update and uh, just... Um, in general, if, if you need uh, uh, updates on prayer requests, you can call the church office. I know that uh, myself, I put out a prayer sheet. Uh, Tom Drury's class puts out an extensive prayer sheet. Uh, the church office does for Wednesday night. And uh, you can call the office and Miss Stephanie will take care of you. She'll get you get you lined up and, and make sure that uh, you get on the, on the prayer sheet there. <clears throat> for my class, um, last Sunday, uh, Amy Durden's sister, uh, Cammie, just uh, pray for God to do a fresh work in her life. And then Steve and Kathy Callens uh, have a 22-year-old grandson, Chandler. Just pray for God to do a fresh work in his life as well. And then Cliff Ross mentioned uh, several. One, uh, Greg Thrash family, just praying for them. He had passed away from cancer. And then he mentioned also uh, Lucy uh, Iser, health concerns. And then Johnny and uh, Mary Jo Adams, also health concerns. Deborah Downey's dad, uh, Steve Wagner, had a stroke two weeks ago. He's a primary caregiver for Deborah's mom, who has advanced dementia. So be praying for them. And then uh, Scott Lee, Scott was diagnosed with uh, Meniere's disease. He's scheduled to have shots uh, in his eardrum soon to help. So be praying for Scott. And then Amy had uh, some kidney issues. Amy Durden, we we'll pray for her. LD supposed to have a nuclear stress test. Just be praying for him. Uh, Bonnie mentioned she has some health concerns, but also uh, her granddaughter, Amber, uh, that lives with her, has tested positive for COVID, and be praying for Amber, and that Bonnie does not get it. <clears throat> There's many others on our prayer sheet uh, mentioned. Uh, I want to update you on Jeff Morris. I talked to Margie the other day. Home health has ended, so they start the next phase, which is uh, outpatient therapy. Uh, it should be sure to tell the Sunday school class and church as a whole that God has put so many good, sweet, godly people in our lives. We appreciate all of them and all the prayers to keep them coming. God is working. We had scheduled a work day several weeks back at Jeff and Margie's house, and we had to reschedule for weather that day. So it is rescheduled for this Saturday, March the 6th, from 8 to 11 and uh, need four or five people to help. Uh, Cliff Ross went over the other day and cleaned up some things in the yard, and, and several people from Jeff's uh, work have been over to help do a few things. But uh, anyway, she's got a few little projects we'd like to take care of for them, and, and uh, if you can help, that'd be great. That's this Saturday from uh, 8 to 11. You can uh, call me or email us, and we'll get you an address uh, from there. All right, we're going to be in Psalm 99 today, Psalm 99, and uh, <clears throat> we still got a long, long way to go, uh, working our way through the book of Psalm, but uh, 99, it's not a very long one, but uh, what a great Psalm of worship. So let's pray, and we'll jump into Psalm. Father, we thank you for this morning, thank you for your word you give us, and uh, we do mention a lot of people praying for health concerns, uh, family members that are lost and need you, and uh, God, we lift them up uh, primarily, and they might come to know you as Savior, and Lord, for others uh, facing uh, surgery and medical tests and extended family, uh, Lord, a lot of details, and uh, Father, we just thank you. You're a big God. Nothing slips past you. We thank you. We can bring all this before you. God, thank you for your word you give us. We pray this morning that um, as we open it up, that your Holy Spirit might work today, and we pray for worship in just a few minutes as well. Brother Glenn delivers your message. God, you might use him in a powerful way. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Psalm 99. <clears throat> All right, let us uh, let me just walk through this uh, this psalm, and, and really I'm going to focus on just a couple of verses uh, out of it. Uh, I, Brother Glenn can walk through a series of verses and then preach a message out of out of one verse, and, and, uh, and I try to just hit, uh, hit the high spots when I walk through. You don't have time to be able to spend detailed time and and uh, but I love how he does that and he picks it apart and all the details of it so but our walk through psalm is supposed to just hit the highlights to give you an overview and then uh, Lord use those at future date to begin to uh, bring you back to studying and 
and spend time with him. Well, let's walk through verse 1, 99 verse 1. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. Well, we talked several weeks, the last few weeks. Many of these psalms deal with the millennial kingdom, uh, when Christ will rule and reign uh, with a rod of iron, and the entire world will be at his submission. It is now, we know that. But that all knees will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord uh, at that time. And it, it'll be a different kind of world than we know now. But the Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. Many times in Scripture, a description of the Lord is such a powerful force of, uh, of our nature. And um, you, you see all types like earthquakes and thunder and lightning. And, and obviously, God's in charge of all of that. And so, but let the peoples tremble. Uh, there is an, an awe and a reverence that belongs only to him. He is enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. <clears throat> I want to look at this word cherubim and talk about that just for a minute. I have several verses that uh, I, I want to read to you, and, and uh, I'm going to be looking to the side a little bit. I've got them on another notepad right here. But um, cherubim, th you know... We, we think of them as precious moments figurines. You know, little little statues that sit on a shelf somewhere. And, and that's kind of what we think about these little Cupid dolls or, or something like that. But that's not what a, a, a cherub is, a cherubim for plural. <clears throat> Ezekiel 1, 4 through 14. Uh, As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, and a bright light around it, and in its midst something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings, and there's a whole lot more to that. Jump down to Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 12. Their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and their wheels were full of eyes all around. The wheels belonging to all four of them. The wheels were called in my hearing the whirling wheels. And each one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. Ezekiel 10, 22. As for the likeness of their faces, they were the same faces whose appearance I had seen by the river Chabar. Each one went straight ahead. Moreover, the Spirit lifted, up, lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faced eastward. And behold, there were twenty-five men at the entrance of the gate, and among them I saw Jazaniah, son of Azor, and Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, leaders of the people. He said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give evil advice in this city. So it's describing the cherub's face and their abilities. <clears throat> and Ezekiel uses that whirling wheel. He hears that. <clears throat> and they had many wings. Look at uh, uh, the, another verse in chapter 10 of Ezekiel. The sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court, uh, like the voice of Almighty God when he speaks. The description of the cherub, Revelation 4. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal in all the center and around the throne. Four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion. The second creature like a calf. The third creature had a face of a man. The fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings and are full of eyes around Within and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. And then uh, in Genesis, uh, so, some people forget about this, but God used this. Uh, he drove man out, and at the east of the gate of Eden, he stationed cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. In Genesis chapter 3. So he's enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. These are not little play figures. These are powerful beings. And God used them, and many times, as a place of war and battle and of guarding. Um, 
They were mighty warriors. And typically, if you see cherubim mentioned in Scripture, it's not long after that that people die. And it's just a fact of where it's at. Uh, they were used for, for an awesome show of strength and power from the Lord. And then verse 2, Psalm 99, And the Lord is great in Zion. He's exalted above all the peoples. He is separate from all peoples. He is holy, he is righteous, and he is just. And there is an, a, a description I saw in a commentary, utter separateness. He is separate. He is without sin. Uh, let them praise your great and awesome name, verse 3. Well, he's the only one who deserves our praise. And then the end of verse 3, holy is he. He, he is holy, and here's a comment, utter separateness of God's being from all other creatures and things, uh, as well as his moral separateness from sin. He is without sin. He is holy. He, he is all unique in that, in that manner. Verse 4 says, The strength of the king loves justice. We see in the millennial kingdom that justice is served fairly, uh, equitably, uh, among all people. Uh, it is swift, uh, something we do not see now. We look forward to that day. Uh, the, the strength of king loves justice. You have established equity. You know, it's, it's ground is level. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There is no one who stands above another before Almighty God. Verse 5, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, holy is he. A, a footstool was a very typical fixture for a king, for him to rest his feet uh, upon. And there's even a reference to this being the Ark of the Covenant. The cherubim, uh, there were two figurines above the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, we see this as uh, it was a place of worship. But here you see, and worship at his footstool. So even what is seen as uh, one of the most powerful figures that we know, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, a place of worship, it's his footstool. And that just shows you how awesome and powerful God is. And there, here we have the words again, just as in verse 3, holy is he. The cherubim in Revelation cried, holy, holy, holy. <clears throat> we sing a hymn, holy, holy, holy. We, we've sang that recently, actually. And um, because he is holy, he is separate, he is, he is unique. He is without sin, without blemish. Uh, he is unable to sin. He, he is not capable of sin. Verse 6, Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. Now, three very prominent uh, heroes in Scripture uh, that God retained, and he, and he desired a very intimate relationship. With these three, and there's others we could list out, Abraham and David and Daniel and, and so many others. Moses and Aaron and Samuel. God maintained a very intimate relationship with them, just as he does with us. It's his choice. He desires to have fellowship with us, to, to have us near him, his creation near him, and calling upon him and worshiping him. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. Well, what, what a great prayer that is, to call upon the Lord, and he answered you. This uh, past week, I, I was uh, presiding over uh, my uncle's funeral, my Uncle Ben. I was up in Birmingham, and the Lord blessed us with a beautiful day on that Wednesday. And I was talking to my Aunt Jewel and, and uh, his wife, and she, uh, she made a statement. She said, the Lord has been so, <clears throat> so good to us. And just talked about the details, even in, in my uncle's passing away, uh, of how all, uh, all the things that have happened and how God used all that. To call upon the Lord, and he answers. What a blessing. He is not a silent God. He is not someone sitting on a pedestal that never says a word like these false gods or 
places of idol worship. <clears throat> he spoke to them in the pillar of, of cloud. Well, he led them through the wilderness by a cloud in the day and fire by night. He spoke to them in a the cloud. He spoke to Moses through a cloud. And uh, we see that, but it shows the awesomeness and the power and the reverence that God is due. And then it says they kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. They kept his ordinances, his statutes, the testimony. They kept and obeyed. And so what's the reward for obedience to the Lord? Is heaven, eternal life. And, and that's what God calls on us. He blesses us with eternal life. All we have to offer that's of any value to him is our life of obedience. That's all we have. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need a cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't even need the hills under those cattle. He has it all. It belongs to him. Only thing that we have to offer him is a life of obedience. Look at verse 8. O Lord our God, you answered them. And he does answer. You cry out before the Lord and he does answer. You were a forgiving God to them. Well, were any of these men perfect? No. Were any of the Old Testament, New Testament figures perfect? No. Matter of fact, we have in Scripture laid out their faults many times. Aren't you grateful that God doesn't just lay all mine and your faults out here in Scripture for the whole world to see? Um, but yet, God is a forgiving God to them. And He is an avenger of their evil deeds. So, He punishes evil. And he disciplines those who disobey him. He is a loving God. His loving kindnesses, as we see even plural many times. Verse 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. Now, where is that? Well, it'll be Zion, Jerusalem in the in millennial kingdom. And then it says, for holy is the Lord our God. He is holy. The hill, the holy hill is Jerusalem, is a temple, the place of worship. He alone is worthy of our worship. And it's also the place where the future uh, messianic kingdom will be. It'll be a place of worship of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, to me, the, the main point of this psalm is listed out in verse 3 and, and then again in verse 5. And it says, holy is he. God is holy. He is separate from us. He is without sin. He is perfect. And that's why he had to offer his only begotten son. You and I could not offer enough to pay for our sin. He offered the perfect sacrifice for you and for I. And the question is, have you trusted him? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Will you spend eternity with him? He rewards those who obey. I'd encourage you, obey what God's Word says. Trust Him as your Savior. Invite Christ into your life and live the full life. Well, thank you for joining with us this morning, and I hope God's used this just to speak into your heart a little bit. He does as mine as I walk through these verses and studying together. Look forward to worshiping with you at uh, 1030, and thank you for joining with us uh, online this morning. God bless you.